All right, so let's talk about the loved ones. This is a Patreon request. One of my first Patreons, Royce Bunn, thank you so much. He wanted me to review this. Actually, something else, but I just couldn't access it, so he said, do loved ones. And I'm so glad he did, because I enjoyed this. In fact, I'll go out on a limb and say, I like this Prom Night movie better than Prom Night with Jamie Lee Curtis. This one's way better up my alley. Prom Night is just boring, all right? Sorry, it just is. So let's talk about loved ones. This is about a guy who gets asked out by this girl to go to prom. He says no, but then she ends up getting him anyways, forcibly into her house where she sets up her own private prom night just for them. And then crazy shit happens left and right. I don't want to spoil too much right now. This will be my spoiler-free section. Let's get into the movie. So what do I like about this movie? We'll start small and then we will work our way up. First up, this has boobs. I always point it out and I will always do it. It is just my thing. I always, always appreciate boobs in movies, especially horror, especially slashers. It's a box that needs to be checked. This isn't a slasher, but I'm glad we got it. You got beautiful women, you got some boobs, some sex, and it's mwah, beautiful. I like the idea behind this voiceless drug that they like inject into the neck and it makes their the victim not be able to scream out and the reason why i like that is a the sound that they make it reminds me of motel hell you know the whole like they cut the throat and like uh, they sound like a smoker who has like the you know the operation where they have to like use a remote or something they, they sound like that i like it Be because of that and because it eliminates immediately the whole typical when the victim wakes up, like, oh my gosh, where am I? Who are you? Why are you doing this? Please let me go. It just, boom, eliminates all the generic dialogue that you would hear in this type of movie, in these types of situations. All that's gone. You don't have to listen to that bullshit no more. I like the prom night setting in the house. It's not really at prom. There are some scenes at a prom, but that's really not the story. It's this homemade prom setup and I like the fact that they chose to make it prom and they have like a disco ball and it's like doing this it has this reflection on you know on the walls and it's spinning and they have streamers they got a banner I like it it just adds atmosphere and I like the you know the juxtaposition of like this beautiful prom night atmosphere next to this crazy torture and just chaos that's you know ensuing within that atmosphere. I really like the opening scene. I like the setup. I like the little character study. We don't get a big, it's not a huge character study, but it, we get to know this main guy, Brent, well enough. We get why he's, you know, going through the emotions that he's going through. He cuts himself. We figure out why. And you feel bad for this character enough to root for him to make it. He is some, he's sympathetic because of the tragedy that he goes through. And then, of course, the tragedy that he's currently going through with this crazy bitch, Lola, ain't helping him at all, but they set up his character well enough where you root for him. The acting is good enough across the board. It's not a horrible performance in the movie. The acting is decent. I really like the score and the soundtracks within the movie. There's a few metal songs that play. There's even this pop song that plays quite a few times throughout. It seems to be like the theme of the main uh, obsessed girl, Lola, that she's even singing herself at one point. And I will admit, she has a pretty good singing voice and it gets stuck in your head. So if you're a metal fan, you'll like some of the soundtracks in here. If you're a fan of the song, if it's a real song, I don't know, I think it is, you'll appreciate that. And just the score itself in certain scenes that really help ramp up the tension. I really like some of the sounds they went with. And I like a couple of little twists and turns that this movie goes for. Because in the first half, it seems like it's just this typical obsessed girl movie, you know, that you would typically see every year. Like every Valentine's Day, there's always that thriller with the obsessed girl stalking this guy. And he's trying to, they're trying to like break that couple up because they want to, you know, jump in that person's place. Yada, yada, yada. Like it's not that movie at all. And that's what I was kind of expecting. Or I was kind of expecting this major revenge carry type thing where, they're kind of sympathetic towards the killer. Like, she never gets asked to prom. They're going to set that character up, and we're going to understand why she's resorting to kidnapping. But they don't go that route at all either. So I was actually surprised. I went in blind, and I'm glad I did, because there was a few extra surprises in the movie because of that. Now, the hottest chick in this movie is Mia, the goth girl who goes out with the dorky pot smoker guy, and that would lead me into my negatives. So... My main negative with this movie is some of the writing regarding what ends up happening towards the end, like the third act. How things come about. It just 
feels useless. There's these characters that are written into this movie, the goth girl and this dorky pot smoker guy, and they really amount to nothing. They're just offsetting the tone. They're comedic in a way that's good. Like I, I like their dynamic together. They're an awkward couple. They shouldn't be together, and it's funny. They're back and forth in the car, and like they're good characters. They're well written enough where you enjoy them, but they don't belong. At least not to me. I felt like they belong in some other movie because for the most part, this is a very uh, macabre torture film. This has like torture, obsession, crazy family. Like it's got all kinds of different genres of you know horror movies in it. You know, even a little bit of slasher in it. It's got the boobs, the sex, crazy killer. It's got all kinds of genres mixed together, and I like that too. But the the comedy just does not belong. It really offsets the tone. It's just a slam on the brakes. You're like, whoa, I went from like sad because this, and then now I'm laughing because of these characters. Now we're back to torture, and now we're back to the... And they, what annoys me more is just that those characters really amount to nothing. They at no point connect to what's really the prime focus of the story, which is Brent and his torture being with this crazy bitch, Lola. They never connect that timeline of events to this it never leads to that these people never find out what's going on to brent it never does shit so it is just completely useless and then the cop character who's tied in a way to those two characters also what he does the one tiny little thing that he serves the little purpose that he serves could have easily be it could have been rewritten to where the main character's girlfriend could have provided that purpose instead. And it would have actually worked better for the film, in my opinion. And I'll get into the details, exactly what I mean by that, later on. This movie is rated R. There's an unrated version, but I had to see the rated R version. It was the only thing I could rent. Uh, I saw the option for unrated, but when I went to it, it like wouldn't let me rent it for some reason. I just couldn't get it. So I had to get the R-rated version. And there's moments where you can tell they're shying away there's a decent amount of on-screen, like, you know, knife penetration to certain body parts. And there's some blood in the movie. There's some bloody moments. There's torture, definitely. But there's moments where you're like, oh, man, I wish I could have got the money shot there. I wish they would have showed more there. You can hear what's going on, but you can't see it. And a little nitpick is that I feel like the main girl, Lola, and, you know, her and her dad, who's, like, helping her, you know, it's not really a spoiler. It's It's very early on. So her and her dad, I feel like they're trying to be too crazy. Like they try so hard to make this extra like fucked up. Like they're trying to throw everything at the wall and just like, let's see how crazy we can get. Let's, you know, insert a little bit of this and that. And it's just like, okay, tone it down. Like how <laughs> it's, it's, but it's still a decent movie overall. I really enjoyed it. I was surprised. I liked it a little neat and little twists and turns. And I like, you know, the acting overall was very good. I like the main character, Brent, well enough to root for him. And there's some good torture scenes. So if you're a fan of torture, and if you're a fan of obsession movies, if you're a fan of just crazy girl slasher movies, because this is almost like a slasher movie, it's got everything. I think th this could appease to a lot of different uh, genre fans of, you know, horror. So when it comes to the loved ones, I recommend that you go out and buy it. Now let's get into the spoiler discussion, and let's quickly get my clap reward for best scene out of the way, and that is the drill scene. And I like this scene because it's followed up by the whole pouring hot water over the whole scene, and I like that it actually happens. Usually you get this set up in movies where the main person is about to get like attacked or, you know, hurt in some extreme violent way, and then something happens that distracts the killer. They walk away, and that person gets unharmed you know but in this one no the drill hits the skull he gets drilled in the head and then she pours water on his face this is like the torture parts of the film and it's very like saw like you know this is at the height of like the torture you know subgenre craze right when saw was wrapping up this came out like right after that and this is definitely a torture film this, this is what some people would call torture porn but I don't really buy into that because it's not porn to me. I'm not jerking off when I watch it. Although, there are some sexy scenes in this movie, I'll admit. So, anyways, this movie opens up with a car crash. We meet Brent. He's talking to his dad, and I like their dialogue together, their chemistry. They're talking about music. Like, you kids these days, and you're heavy metal. This is shit. It's just believable dialogue. 
that really worked for me because I could see myself having that conversation with my dad. And I feel like we have had that conversation before, but Brent, he crashes his car. I think he's like 17 or something. He's still in high school. So he probably just got his license and now he crashed and killed his dad. And that guilt is really fucking him up mentally. Now it's six months later. He's a pot smoker. He's cutting himself. He's still listening to that heavy metal music. And he just goes out in the woods to calm down every now and then with his dog. We get to really know this character a little bit before shit hits the fan. So I like that we have a breather to know this character in the aftermath of that opening scene. What it's done to him. It's made him not appreciate life. It's made him not appreciate the women in his life. His girlfriend. He's got a beautiful girlfriend who I think is just too good for him. You know, they're in the parking lot. You know, he just got asked out by crazy bitch Lola, who you know she's crazy from the moment you meet her because she's asking the guy to prom, which is the reverse of how life usually works. And you don't usually see women asking guys out. But another thing besides her asking him out that made you know that she was crazy is that she does that whole like 10 second pause between answering questions like, what do you want? And she just stares at him for like 10 seconds and then asks him out. But the girlfriend... You know, they don't really set her character up that well, and I wish we would have gotten more to her, because all we get is that she's gorgeous, and she loves her boyfriend, but he doesn't really love her back. He doesn't appreciate what he has with her, and I guess it's because of the tragedy that he went through in the opening. He just doesn't appreciate things in life no more. He doesn't appreciate what he has, which he should. When you lose your dad, you should appreciate anyone you have in your life a hell of a lot more, because she's, like, in the car with him, she's fucking him, and... Then she starts blowing him, and then Lola sees it, and I guess that triggers her even more and makes her pissed off and jealous. Because after all, this is an obsession movie, right? And so, and it, like, she drops him off because he's not driving no more. I think he, I don't think he lost his license, but he's just not driving no more. He doesn't trust himself behind the wheel anymore, which makes sense. And she drops him off, and she's like, I love you. And then he just goes, uh, Lola asked me out to prom, just to let you know. Shuts the door. And that's important information for her to know because that helps her at the end of the movie go, oh yeah, he's probably with that bitch Lola cheating on me. And I feel like that's how this movie should have ended. Like that's how that scene should have played into the film later. The whole him not saying I love you back should have been the seed planted in her mind. Like the whole like it would have made her think like, oh, he doesn't love me. And he's probably cheating on me, and that's what gets her to the location later on. And then we never actually get... I found it odd that we don't get that, you know, that arc that you would typically get with a scene like that at the end. Because it happens in Wishmaster 3 where a character won't say I love you back because that character also in Wishmaster 3 had a family tragedy. And at the end of the movie, they finally say I love you back. Like, they, you know, that's their growth. You actually don't get that in this movie. I thought that was odd. I was expecting at any moment at the end of the movie for the main character to be like, I love you. I finally learned to say it now and appreciate you more. But we don't get that. So that's kind of different. But yeah, I, I just feel like that scene could have played into the film a hell of a lot more. Like that could have made her jealous and realize that maybe he's cheating on her. And that's why she goes to the house to try to rescue him later on. But that... Never goes anywhere. He never says, I love you, and even at the end of the movie. And that scene never really does shit. The only thing that was important in that scene was the fact that he said, oh yeah, Lola is the one who asked me out. So, um, I don't want to jump too far ahead. I know I just kind of went quickly to the end, but let's jump back here. So yeah, then we meet this odd date, and they're the couple, the goth girl and the, the dorky the pot smoker, and it's just completely useless to the story, 100%. You could do without it. And... The main character, Brent, he goes into the woods to smoke pot, listen to that heavy metal. He's trying to find his happy place, you know, like in Happy Gilmore. And he gets, you know, gagged, you know, chloroform rag, kidnapped by this guy and going into a blind. I didn't know who this guy was. I was like, oh, shit, that's not Lola. Who's this guy? And then you find out quickly that's the dad. The dad kidnaps people for his daughter. And then his dog that he had with him when he got kidnapped is, like, dying. It's on its last breath. It's crawling home. It gets to, like, the doorsteps of his house. And the girlfriend's there, you know, like, where's Brent? We're supposed to go to prom. And just the sound of the dog when it's dying is just the saddest thing ever. It was so sad. The sound that they inserted into it was just, ugh. And then, yeah, Lola's obsessed with him. She, she shows him the yearbook. He has, she has, like, a heart around him. This is when it feels like a generic, like, obsession movie. But it has a couple of twists and turns later on that I will get into that really saved it. 
And so, yeah, she's obsessed, or so we think. And it's this table, it's the crazy table scene from Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Like, imagine the last 10 minutes of Texas Chainsaw Massacre, but the entire movie. That's what this is. They're in this di- dinner room, you know, the kitchen at dinner table and crazy shit is just happening in that room the entire time. You know, even the dad comes in with like a hammer, just like in Texas Chainsaw Massacre with the grandpa with the old hammer. And, you know, like he needs to pee, you know, but they inject, but first they inject that thing in his throat that I was talking about, my positives earlier that I really like because of the sound and the smartness of it. Like that's what you would do if you were a psychopath killer. You didn't want anybody to hear screaming, but he has to pee and then, She's like, all right, well, you're not going to the restroom. So she just grabs his dick, puts it like a jar, puts it in the jar. Like, all right, you got 10 seconds to piss or my dad's going to drive a nail through your dick with that hammer. And then he has it. Like, dude, could you imagine the pressure of that? That would fucking suck. Like, I have a shy bladder enough. Like, if I go into a bathroom and I really need to pee, if somebody walks in, that that feeling, just boom, it's gone. I don't have to pee no more. Bye. Could you imagine adding that much pressure <laughs> just like all right if you don't piss i'm gonna nail your dick literally with this nail like that's just awful and then he pees on like the 10th second that's a good tense scene i really like that it was just kind of it's dark humor because you're, you're like laughing because it's just so insane this movie does try to like go over the top with just how crazy these people are and the torture and she shows him uh, okay so he escapes he kicks her and then he goes outside, but his feet are, like, you know, tied together. And then he's hiding underneath the car. The dad gets in the car. He starts driving away. But then he sees, you know, the character Brent. And then he climbs up the tree after, like, loosening his rope beneath, uh, around his feet. And he's up in the tree, and they're throwing rocks. I don't know where all these rocks are coming from. It seems like they have, like, a bunch down there. And they're throwing rocks. And this is just me thinking, like, if I was in that situation, I would try to catch one of those rocks and throw it back at them. Like seriously, just he's trying to like dodge all of them and then he just boom, hit in the head, falls down, gets knocked out. Now he's back to square one again. Except this time, to prevent that from happening again, they get like a big old like steak knife and they hammer it through one of his feet. <laughs> and then she's like trying to slow dance with him while his foot is nailed to the floor. And then she shows him a scrapbook, the little victim scrapbook of, like, all these victims since she was, like, five. Like, you can see a picture of her as, like, a little girl, and they've been doing this forever. It's basically all her victims. It's not like just she's – it's not like she's just obsessed with him. I like that. I like It's not just an obsession movie. It's like, oh, shit, no, this isn't just her obsessed with him. She just kind of gets obsessed but then kind of moves on to the next thing like a child. You know, like a child that gets a new toy or Barbie and then plays with it with a little while and is like, nah, fuck this. I want a new toy. And that's what she is, basically. You know, she went from toys and quickly to, like, humans as her toys. Basically, all her victims are like Barbies to her. She dresses them up for prom. She draws on them with a knife. She has, like, a signature thing that she carves into them. It was a scene that kind of reminded me of, like, Inglorious Bastards. Just because of the dialogue, it was very reminiscent like immediately when this scene was playing i was like inglorious bastards because she carves like her signature which is like a heart with her initials in it which is fucked up and then it's like a shot of just them staring at the camera and the dad's like you know you're getting pretty good at that and it it just took me right back to inglorious bastards where aldo rain is like this might be my masterpiece and the other guy's like yeah you're getting pretty good at that you're carving a swastika in the head so, yeah, like, she's got this whole scrapbook. She's been killing people basically, like, every six months, like, once or twice a year, her and her dad get a date that they kidnap because when he first arrives there as, you know, Brent, there's this other woman with this mysterious hole in her head, and you're like, what the fuck is that? And then you get the scene where they try to drill, they drill a hole in his head, and then you find out why when they open the cellar and there's all these like zombies down there. It's like the collection, you know, the collector, he has all these like drugged up zombies in his cellar that he has like, they're like his army. But in this movie, they have all these people in the basement. They're victims from previous years, I guess, that they're just taken care of for some reason. They're like their pets. They're not, they're not their army, like the collector, they're their pets. So their victims are basically their pets for like the dad and Barbie dolls for the girl. And they're like picking up roadkill and feeding it to them. And there's like a stack of bones down there. Like I said, like this goes from like obsession movie to like 
Texas Chainsaw Massacre to like a little bit of the collection. They got like all this crazy shit in the cellar. I just like all the little twists and turns within the movie. It's awesome. And then you find out that, you know, they crash at the beginning because there was this bloody guy walking in the road and that was a victim of Lola's six months prior. And I guess he died because he's, we, that's another like little twist or just revelation is that the guy in the road is the brother of the golf girl at the prom with the dorky pot smoker guy. I didn't write their names down. <laughs> so you find out that, you know, he's related to them, but that still doesn't do shit. Like that doesn't tie them to this story really all that much. It doesn't make them important. Why are we focusing on them? It's just, it's still, it's still irrelevant. I don't get why we focus so much time. I feel like it's just filler. All the time at the prom with the dorky guy and the golf chick, it's just filler. It's just padding out the runtime. And this movie has a good pace still, even with all that shit. But it's just, it doesn't feel needed. But yeah, I like that little twist. Like, oh, that's who that guy was. I was wondering who that was. And it's a victim. And and they don't even know where he's at. And Lola's like, yeah, he's the one that got away. I wonder, he's probably dead somewhere. So they never even retrieved his body. <laughs> I like the scene where she wins prom queen. Like the dad's like, and this year's prom queen is. And she's like giddy with anticipation. She's like, I wonder who it's going to be. It's like, who else could it be? You're the only bitch here. And she, the dad's like, Lola. And then she's like, oh my God, I can't believe I won. It's like, I just love that. It just adds to her insanity that she still is like surprised that she keeps winning prom queen. Like, oh my gosh, I can't believe I won again. And then this movie tries to like insert incest and it's really not needed. It's just, that's what I meant by like they're trying hard to go crazy. Like, let's see what else we can do to just make this fucking nuts. Let's try to insert incest, but not really go for it. Like they insert it a little bit, but they don't really go for it. They never are like making out. They... There's, like, one scene where she gets her prom dress, and she's like, wait, Dad, like, let me know how I look in it. And she gets, like, half naked in front of Dad, and the Dad's kind of like, ooh, like, I shouldn't be looking. Like, he's the only, he seems to like he has a little bit more of a moral compass than the daughter. Like, you thought he was insane, more insane to her, because he obviously raised her to be insane from birth because of those pictures. So he should be more insane, but she seems to be more insane. She's, like, all about the incest. She doesn't care, like... I'll kiss you, even though you're my dad. But he's like, mm, I shouldn't be looking, but I'm going to look anyways because you're my daughter and you're, you're my princess and I do all this crazy shit for you. Like, the dad is basically pussy whipped. Like, she, he is her bitch. He's like Leatherface and she's the cook. Like, she's in charge of the operation. Like, you go get me victims and whatnot. So, yeah, and then, like, later on, more incest almost, like, She's like, nah, like, I'm done with you, Brent. You're not my Prince Charming. You're not the one either. And I'm, you know, my dad's my Prince Charming. And she, like, tries to kiss him. And he's kind of, like, backing away a little bit. But then he starts going in because, you know, he's got to do what little princess wants. And But then it gets interrupted and they don't kiss. So it's like they're trying to go for it, but then they pull away. It's like, well, do it or don't try at all. They're just... You're, don't try to act like you're going to go all crazy and incest and then actually not do it. It's just, I feel like that's just, it's not needed. Like, let's just have them be crazy. We don't need to add incest on top of it. It's just, it didn't work for me. That whole, I could, I could do without that. I like that the geek actually gets to fuck the girl. Like, you know, it cuts back once again after the incest thing. We cut back to the dorky guy and the girl and she's like fucking his brains out in the car and it's like a fake out scare because you think for some reason because it shows them leave the prom and then they're in their car fucking and then it cuts back to the crazy dad leaving the house and you see like a car that looks similar to theirs right outside you're like why the hell are they parking at this place and then it's like revealed that no they're actually at the school so it's like a neat little like fake out scare and so yeah that's the only purpose they served (laughs) i guess and we find out that the cop is related to the goth girl and you know he's and therefore he's also related to the victim that we saw in the opening. So that's why he goes there. And he goes there because the main guy, Brent's girlfriend, she remembers that conversation about, you know, Lola asked me out. So she tells the police and the cop goes there by himself, looks through the window, sees blood everywhere and doesn't do what a cop would do. And that is immediately call for like, a coroner, ambulance, and backup. Like, okay, clearly there's some bodies in here. There's blood everywhere. So I got to go call for help. Like, do that first and then break in. Seriously. Like, that was one of those character decisions that pissed me off. And it's a cliche. It really is. A cop that comes into the movie, 
there, you know, that little moment of hope where you're like, oh my gosh, maybe he'll save her. Poof, nope, he's dead. Bye bye. He's just useless. All he did for the movie was provide an exit vehicle for Brent. But here's the thing Lola is already on the way. Like, not Lola, the girlfriend of Brent. She's on the way the next morning because he's not back yet. She remembers that conversation and she probably thinks he's cheating on her. So she's going there and she can provide that exit vehicle. Like, this movie could have been rewritten to where you didn't have the cop and you didn't have the dorky, awkward, you know, couple at prom because really they do nothing. And you could have just had the girlfriend actually serve a purpose in the movie because when you think about it, she really does nothing other than tell the cop who also does nothing to go to the fucking place. It's like, really? Like, she should have provided that exit vehicle. Like, I feel like that if that was the writing of the movie, I feel like it could have served the plot and story a lot better than these wasted characters that really do nothing and amount to absolutely nothing. That's just my thought. Anybody else? Anybody else agree? You get where I'm coming from? All right, I know I could just jump forward, but let's jump back a little bit. I love when he kills the dad. He gets his sharp necklace, boom, boom, stabs him in the neck, pushes him into like the torture chamber down below, and then he starts getting eaten by his own little pets down there. They almost look like descent creatures because they're pale. They haven't seen the sunlight in years. And they you you hear what's going on, but you don't see it. They never show you the money shot of like how fucked up is his face and throat that they've been eating and chewing at. You don't get the money shot, and it's just a shame. But then the boyfriend, Brent, he's thrown down in the basement also, and I feel like there was just something missing. Was there something cut out? I feel like there was a scene missing where he has to kill the other victims because they're crazy and they're out of their mind from all the years of torture and just being a hostage that he has to kill them in self-defense, but that's not in the movie. Like that scene could have played out a lot better if we really got to see him versus the other victims because he like uses their bodies and all these bones to like make a pile that he can climb on to exit the cellar, which was a cool visual. It's just very macabre, all these like bones and bodies that you stack and they get to the top. I thought that was a cool little visual. But yeah, I just feel like that scene could have played out a lot more. They really could have amplified the tension and the scares down there with those creatures, but they really underutilized that scene. So yeah, then the girlfriend is on the way. She's like, all right, I'm going to go there. I'm going to see if my boyfriend's cheating on me. That motherfucker didn't say I love you. And she's like, she bumps into the crazy girl, Lola. She's walking down the road. She's singing this song to herself. Am I not pretty enough? And that song just gets stuck in your head after you watch the movie. And she stops the car. You know, Lola, she opens up the door and she has like a knife in her hand. She's got the blood all over her. She's got the boyfriend's necklace. The girlfriend sees this and she doesn't put the car in drive like a normal person. Just go. Instead, the car's in park. She gets attacked. She runs out of the car and then just runs down the road towards the house. <laughs> so then the boyfriend uh, gets into the cop car, which should have just been the girlfriend's car, that's the purpose that she should have served. He gets in the cop car. He's doing like 140 down the road. This is the first time he's driven since the accident in the beginning. And what does he do as soon as he starts driving again? He runs over, not the girlfriend, which is what I thought they were going to do. I was going to be so pissed. Like, if you run over and murder your poor girlfriend who's so nice to you and you won't even say I love you, I'm going to be pissed. But he swerves around her, and instead of hitting the tree, he hits that bitch Lola. So I just like the irony behind that. Like, he stopped driving because the last time he drove, he killed somebody, his dad. And he swore off driving. Now he has to drive. And what does he do? He kills again. Except this time, he kills that bitch Lola. But he runs over her like 100 miles an hour, hits the windshield, blood splat, hits the ground. You think she's dead, but nope. Just like a typical horror movie, like they say in Scream, one final scare, except... I like this final scare because it's not like she pops up and she's like able to walk and she's just fine. No, she's on the road. She kind of looks like Chucky at the end of Child's Play 2. She's just like on the road with a knife like I'm going to fucking get you. Like she's still just got this drive and energy. Even though her legs and one of her arms is broken, she's got this knife. She's like dragging herself across the asphalt. It's just, it was hilarious. And then they just put the car in reverse. We get this long, too long slow-mo shot of the girl's face and then the bumper just hits her right in the face cuts away and that was just off like really that like this ending could have been more cathartic i would have loved if we got like a collection ending spoiler for that movie if he went to her 
captured her because she's got like broken legs and a broken arm. She's vulnerable. Capture her and do everything she did to you right back to her. That's what I wanted. But no, quick death. She did not deserve a quick death. So not cathartic enough, but I'm glad he made it uh, physically. I don't think he made it mentally because, you know, losing his father made him like resort to pot and being a loner. Even though he's got a girlfriend, he just doesn't appreciate her. He's hard to be with. So if that did that much damage to his psyche and his personality, imagine the 12 hours of torture, what that did to him now. <laughs> so I don't think he made it afterwards. He's going to be like Sally at the end of Texas Chainsaw Massacre, just laughing. She's going to be in a psych ward. But yeah, we don't really get like a that uh, ending that you would expect, like where he has that moment with the girlfriend. This movie doesn't really have much at the end. It kind of ends abruptly. Like, just, it's just kind of like, you know, he hits the girl, the you know, Lola, and then we see a slow-mo shot of like him hugging his mom. They reunite. He's like, I'm back home. I survived the night. And then it's over. Like, again, the other characters, dorky guy, golf girl, nothing. That golf girl, we never see her find out that, you know, what happened to her brother. Like, it's never revealed to her. Like, hey, here's what happened to your brother. We found out who it was, Lola. Here's what happened. Oh, and by the way, your dad's dead. He got a hatchet to his fucking face because he's a terrible cop who didn't call for backup. Like, none of that's revealed. Like, again, useless use of those characters. Why are they here? Am I insane for thinking this? Like, seriously, what the fuck? And then he never says I love you to his girlfriend. They don't have that arc where he learns to appreciate her. I assume he did. I would hope so. How could you be with that crazy bitch for 12 hours being tortured all night and not realize, oh shit, I guess I did have a pretty awesome girlfriend who at least blew me in a car in a parking lot outside of school where we could get busted. She's a risk taker. She's awesome. It's not like she was drilling your feet and pouring hot water on your face. You should say, I love you. That's the message of the movie. <laughs> Say, I love you, or get the fuck out of that relationship if you don't appreciate her. All right? I'm talking to you, men. Appreciate your women. So, I, yeah, that's really the end of the movie. Um, I probably glossed over all the torture parts of the movie, you know, pouring the water on the face, drilling the hole. What did you think about this movie? Put your thoughts of it in the comments below. Thank you so much again to my Patreon who requested this movie. It was a good pick. I'm glad you recommended it. And I... I I'm kidding. It would be funny if I found out that he recommended it to me because he was expecting me to hate it. Like, oh, I bet he'll hate this movie because I hate it too. That'd be funny. But maybe he likes it too. I hope he does. Uh, let me know. <laughs> but yeah, thank you so much to my Patreon. And if you want to become a Patreon, I'll have a link in the description box below. You can join for as little as a dollar a month to request movie reviews like this one. If you like what you've seen here, you can hit this like button, share with all your friends, and become a subscriber today just by clicking on my cartoon face in about five seconds. And until next time, I'll feed her scene. <laughs>